thank you for having me. Um, this is a paper entitled Principles of Problematic Patents, and I'm co-authoring with Will Hubbard from the University of Baltimore Law School. It's very much a work in progress, so I appreciate any feedback that uh, you guys might give. Um, so, let's start with the uh, overall issue. Uh, there's a common narrative I'm sure you've encountered in patent law that there are certain uh, broad classifications of patents that are considered, for lack of a better word, problematic. There's not always the terminology that's used, but it's the terminology we're using. Um, for instance, uh, you're probably familiar with the narrative that software and business method patents are problematic in the sense that they're thought, based upon uh, some evidence, to overall uh, produce uh, less innovation uh, in the areas where they're prevalent. Uh, on the other hand, we have this other category of broad categories of patents that are thought to be non-problematic. Uh, again, according to this common narrative, the areas of invention that are commonly singled out are pharmaceutical and chemical areas where uh, the patent system is said to be working uh, better and that the right balance between incentive and innovation is roughly, it seems to be, struck. So if, you, if we were to visualize this on a spectrum between categories of patents that are less problematic or problematic, uh, we might stick the less problematic patents over there. I'm just being cut off a little bit. That's okay. Um, on the left, and uh, the more problematic on the left, and the less problematic patents on the right. Um, so what's, what's the problem? We don't think that classifying patents in terms of such broad swaths uh, on broad generalizations as either being problematic or non-problematic is all that helpful. Such broad classifications don't really enter, answer more fundamental questions such as what makes these broad categories of patents seem to be more or less problematic. Are all problematic patents problematic in the same way or the common themes to what makes a patent more or less problematic? Um, and uh, our fundamental question is, is there a way to make this inquiry more systemis, uh, systematic and rigorous uh, rather than a broad generalization? And we're wondering if we can do this not at, just at the level of categories of patents, but at the level of individual patents, uh, classifying them as more or less problematic. So uh, we believe that there is a way, uh, a more informative and systematic way, of expressing the concept of a patent being more or less problematic than is at least more theoretically grounded in the intuitive narrative that we just explored. Um, so in short, we're saying that any time a patent or a group of patents is thought to be problematic, what this actually means is that it can be decomposed uh, into a more granular set of issues. It can be decomposed into a set of lower level uh, patent policies that are not being met by this patent or uh, group of patents. So we, we think that having a multi-dimensional expression of this idea is, is a more informative and better way of expressing the concept of problematic. Um, and that when we label something intuitively as problematic, what we mean to say is that there is a particular set of patent policies or goals that are not being furthered by this patent or collection of patents. And we can express uh, exactly how it is problematic by articulating the specific policies that are or are not being met, and the degree to which they're not being met. So that's really abstract. Let me just give you an example. I'm not going to actually go through this example right now, but I just wanted to illustrate the concept of uh, decomposing the concept of problematic by breaking it down into individual dimensions. So on the y-axis, we have just a sampling of the individual dimensions along which a patent could be problematic, and then on the x-axis across, we have a rough scoring. It's not going to be uh, a numerically precise scoring, but a rough relative scoring of how uh, this might work. Um, so this is just, I'll go through this example a little bit 
uh, in more detail later, later on, but I just want to visually illustrate the idea, because I myself am a visual learner. Um, all right, so what's our approach to this more granular expression of problematic? Our primary approach is to develop a taxonomy, a taxonomy of patent problems that allow us to have a more nuanced discussion about the way in which groups of patents or individual uh, patents can be more or less problematic. Um, here's an example of, of one part of our taxonomy here, which I'm not going to go into uh, detail because it's uh, we don't really have time. But uh, I'll just, I'm going to go through the process by which we uh, generated the taxonomy. Um, we believe that using a multi-dimensional taxonomy has some benefits. Uh, for one, you can really talk about exceptions to the rule, as we will discuss about. So while it might be true that business method patents uh, are overall counterproductive, you might find the exception that is. And you want to have a way of expressing why it is or is not the exception to the rule. So I'll give an example of that. Um, and vice versa. Uh, we, we can also examine the relationship between existing patents and existing law and the degree to where there's a mismatch or alignment with law. And then finally, uh, we think it can be more helpful in evaluating patent reform proposals as well. So those are sort of our three benefits. Okay, so if we're trying to generate a fairly robust taxonomy about the dimensions along which patents can be uh, problematic or not problematic, where does it come from? And the answer is primarily patent theory and secondarily patent law as it is written and uh, currently applied. So let's walk through that a little bit. So let's look at patent story, uh, patent theory as a source of dimensions for our taxonomy. So uh, I don't need to bore you with the familiar theoretical story of why we have the patent system at all. Uh, we're trying to incentivize, but it, it, I need to go through it a little bit just to illustrate where we get our taxonomy. So we're trying to ex uh, incentivize a class of inventions that we think would be underproduced or maybe accelerating their invention. Uh, what inventions? Well, inventions that are relatively costly to discover, uh, relatively easy to copy once discover, and then there are other societal mechanisms that are inadequate to uh, induce their creation or incentivize them. But we want to do this efficiently. Uh, so efficiently means we're trying to avoid imposing undue social costs, costs to other inventors uh, in terms of inhibiting uh, their discovery, uh, notice costs, um, dead weight uh, losses in terms of uh, super competitive patent costs, litigation costs, transaction costs, etc. We don't want to overcompensate inventors as well. We want to compensate them, uh, you know, one dollar more than we had to in the ideal world and uh, only just. Um, so uh, these serve as a source of dimensions for our taxonomy. So patent law is a series of goals. For example, provide just enough incentive to induced investment, but no more. And then it, we don't just have goals. We have these goals implemented in actual patent laws. So we write a patent law, uh, and every patent law has one or more embedded assumptions in it. So for instance, uh, if we're trying to create an appropriate incentive, uh, we've picked a 20-year term. So that reflects some assessment that that's somehow an appropriate um, incentive uh, to match our patent goal. So um, these are the sources of our taxonomy. If you look through the theoretical justifications and the theoretical model of what patent law is trying to do and how patent law is currently written, we can come up with a series of dimensions. And then we can reframe the term problematic as how does a category of patents or an individual patent diverge for our series of patent goals and assumptions, or how closely does it cue and to each of these goals along multiple dimensions. So a problematic patent is one that fails to further one or more goals of patent law to some significant degree, and, uh, or there has, uh, it has a mismatch with assumptions embedded in existing patent laws as written. Um, all right, so with that in mind, we can revisit this 
Uh, this is cut off a little bit, but to say that more problematic patents are ones that don't further primary patent goals or match assumptions embedded in patent law along multiple dimensions. So that's what business method patents and software method patents are. And less problematic are ones that tend to further patent goals along uh, multiple dimensions. So, um, so we're fleshing out our taxonomy by looking at patent theory and uh, figuring out what it's trying to accomplish and what assumptions it makes and then what assumptions are embedded in law. And we, we use this list of assumptions as our list of dimensions by which we score individual patents or groups of patents along these dimensions to have a multi-dimensional view of this. Okay, so let's look at some simple examples here um, of assessing patent groups along these multiple dimensions. And again, my uh, caveat is this. These are just a few of these dimensions and they're a little cut off, I'm sorry to say. But uh, I will read those, uh, some of those to you. So here we're looking at pharmaceutical patents. And I think one of the ways to validate our intuition that pharmaceutical patents are less problematic is the fact that they score highly across multiple dimensions. So for instance, one of our assumptions built into a patent theory is that the invention we're trying to incentivize is costly to develop, and uh, patent, pharmaceutical patents tend to score well on that dimension. Uh, R&D costs are extremely expensive in uh, molecule discovery and clinical trials are extremely expensive. So if we restore it on this non-precise relative uh, spectrum, we might you know, give it a 9 or a 10. Um, overall, these inventions tend to have a high social value. That's another underlying assumption in patent law. Um, maybe aren't, you know, compared to business patent, the patents, we think they do. Uh, what about the patent term of 20 years? Well, that seems, you know, uh, reasonably appropriate in the context of pharmaceutical patents when clinical trials can take five to ten years and uh, drug discovery can take, you know, five to ten years as well. So one of the reasons, and there are multiple other dimensions, I think, that pharmaceutical patents score highly as well. So this sort of validates our intuition uh, explaining why we think pharmaceutical patents are less problematic. Now let's uh, contrast this with business method patents uh, along a few dimensions, and we see that they just simply score uh, fairly low on many of the patent goals and policies, so uh, we don't think of them as being particularly expensive to develop. Businesses don't have uh, significant business method R&D budgets or business method research departments. Um, so that seems to be a mismatch. Uh, the 20 year term, for instance, seems uh, to be overcompensation. Uh, we don't generally think of them as producing extremely high uh, social value overall. Um, but what's interesting, I think, about this is it allows us to articulate the exception to the rule. So uh, penicillin in medicine was an extremely socially valuable invention. And even if we agree that business method patents are uh, overall not that socially useful, which could be debatable, we can imagine a future world in which we discover the penicillin analog of business method patents, and we, the exception to the rule, and we want to have a way of expressing this. Why is this business method patent useful uh, and perhaps worth it when all these other business method patents are? And again, if we would score it along the dimensions, we would see uh, maybe it has extremely high social value, or it was extremely costly to develop. Uh, it's unique along those dimensions across other business methods. So I think what this taxonomy hopefully allows us to do is have a more nuanced conversation about some of the generalizations uh, that we tend to make. I won't go into this in detail because I'm rolling, running low on time, but it also exposes, I think, some of the tensions in our discussions in the patent system. So there's a robust tension about whether or not uh, DNA, pure DNA, should be patented or not. And I think part of this tension is the fact that 
they something like you know BRCA1 and BRCA2 score very high on the social value um, dimension, but also very high on imposing downstream uh, invention costs. So we it really helps to highlight this tension when we score it in this way. It makes it such that it's not so clear. Uh, I think some of the you know uh, medical uh, uh, the Prometheus type patents also illustrate a similar um, issue as well that I think this helps clarify. Um, uh, another thing I help that I think this uh, hopefully helps clarify is it allows us to assess, I think in a more nuanced manner, uh, patent laws. Right? So uh, as Mark and others have noted have noticed in rational ignorance. Laws are always going to be under and over-inclusive uh, to some respect, and we need to strike the right balance, in a sense. We don't necessarily uh, want to be excluding all problematic uh, patents or categories of patents, because that might not be the efficient route to be filtering them out up front. Um, so I think by looking at uh, patent laws along individual dimensions, I think we're able to have a more nuanced conversation about the costs and benefits of uh, individual patent laws in light of ideas such as rational ignorance. Um, so let me, let me stop there. We're still fleshing out this taxonomy. Um, it's still a mid-stage project, and I really welcome your thoughts. Um, and uh, we, uh, we're hoping that this allows us to have a more robust and rigorous conversation, but if you disagree, uh, please let us know or any suggestions that you might offer to improve it. So, yes? So, the first thing is obviously expanding your taxonomy to take account of non-utilitarian of a particular sort normative concerns. Okay, uh -huh. um, So. You know, natural law theories of why we have patents, uh, prospect theory, uh, but mostly look. I mean, this is just the subject matter exclusion discussion. And when you say problematic <coughs> patents, the most problematic patents historically have been pharmaceutical patents, not because of the utilitarian, but because of the the ontological norms. So you know, we could get Mark involved in the conversation if you like. But this is a much more difficult issue because you're going to have very incongruous criteria which people hotly dispute their validity. That's a, that's a really good point. We definitely have a normative commitment here to utilitarian framework, but that is not the only or the most necessarily reason why I think people view them as problematic around the world. Yeah, I think that's good. So maybe we need a meta taxonomy. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I, I think the question is, what do you hope to learn from the application of this taxonomy, right? So as I'm looking at your uh, uh, various proposed screenshots, I think, well, you know what, boy, that sure doesn't seem like that's the right number for this, right? Is it the case that there are no other incentives to generate pharmaceutical patents or BRCA? No, I put that way over on the other side. We've got eight other different kinds of exclusivity. Uh, it may be that we still want patents, but, but but it moved that, right? Is it the case that BRCA is demonstrably new? Well, yeah, for the two weeks before the uh, other independent inventor found it, but maybe you mean something differently by demonstrably new. Now, so one question, you know, my question is not really sort of like, did you get the BRCA or the pharmaceutical ones right? It's what do we learn um, by having this taxonomy, right, that's anything other than we're going to have to fight over the uh, justification for each different patent and each different category separately. If you break it down too far into kind of individual patents, I wonder kind of how useful the taxonomy can be. Yeah, no, this is a great point. So you're absolutely right. Our point is not to say that BRCA is an 8 rather than a 7 on a uh, social value scale. But I think it's more of an exercise or even a thought experiment. So I think just by walking through the individual dimensions and trying to be rigorous and systematically classifying, that's a useful exercise. And then it helps highlight attention. So why are we arguing about BRCA? Well, I think it's a seven, and you think it's a three. That's suddenly, I think, a useful insight that might not otherwise come up 
um, on on that, even if we're not particularly, you know, in agreement about the score. Can I briefly follow yeah. up? Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm curious what happens. I mean, it's no accident. I think that most of the things you have align all on one side or all the other, and I'm curious what happens when that's not true. So let's imagine the pharmaceutical patent where everything lines up in favor of strong protection, except this particular invention we actually know is not new at all. Right? It's right. A, it's a zero on the new scale. Is the is the is the loss? Are we just adding these numbers, or is the kind of the fact that one of them's over on one side somehow uh, uh, driving the inquiry? Do they all have to align? No, no, they don't. I think it's just an it, it's an expression of some uh, maybe uh, an unarticulated discomfort that we might have. So, say you see such a patent, and you're like, this seems like a good pharmaceutical patent. But I can really express why there's some lingering unhappiness. And then if you, I think if you were to list all the dimensions and say, aha, there is, even though it has high social value, there's substantial question about whether it's new. And I think by singling that out and seeing that there, it helps focus the locus of the tension. That's at least our thought. Yeah. So I'm going to say one thing I, I, I like about the project when it's done in a, in a limited way and yeah. then a problem, I think, that it suffers from. Okay. Uh, so what I think is uh, positive is the fact that you are forcing people to have more intelligent discussions, right? If you're trying, people are trying to hide behind words like problematic that are vague, maybe you can identify a whole set of axes along which these discussions have. And I can see people, when they want to fight over a patent, each filling out the little form. And this then serving, so the paper itself shouldn't say this paper is a, this, this, any individual patent is a seven. But it should just give a form that structures arguments between individuals so that those arguments can occur on a slightly more intelligent basis and productive basis rather than hiding behind words like problematic. So I think that, so long as you aren't saying this patent is a seven, but instead you're saying here's one element uh, axis on which the debate has to happen, uh, I think it could be really helpful. The problem that I see, though, is about um, decide, in patent law, we are constantly making categorical judgments and saying that, okay, because, or we're debating about when categorical judgments are appropriate, right? So you say, uh, was this invention costly to produce, right? In theory, under the non-obviousness doctrine, that's only a really minor component, right? We're using a technological proxy because we actually can't get into the economics of any individual path. Right. So one of the looming questions in the background here that your project can't resolve but points out is, even though these are relevant if patent law were to take a bottom-up economic approach to the analysis of whether each patent should be granted, here's the list of variables. Actually, we only choose to look at a very limited subset of them. We use proxies for those concerns yes. when we're determining what constitutes a valid patent. So there is a, a disconnect right, between the things that we'd, we'd use to measure the ideal patents that should always measure and what we're actually doing in the patent regime. So someone could come back and say, look, I'm not going to argue that point because we've decided as a matter of patent law, this dimension is just not something that we are, we think we are capable of measuring on a patent by patent basis. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a terrific point. And that's something we'll have to struggle, you know, our dimension list could be as many as 30 or more dimensions, and then some of which may be much more important as patent law as implemented, or, you know, as we all know, there are multiple patent laws that get at the same dimension from nine different angles, and then other dimensions are almost entirely ignored. I think that's a great point.